All right, so this lecture is about how to measure and calibrate X-ray data with the device. So let's start by, by actually watching again our Lotus Root video to remind how this thing works. We have here Andreas. Yeah. The lab looks a little bit different now, but, uh, but it works the same way. So you need to pick up some kind of fan. We will have some some uh, options for you later. There needs to be some contrast in the X-ray accumulation in whatever you choose. So you need to enter it inside uh, the machine and then uh, because we are doing 2D tomography for computational reasons and also for simplicity reasons, it's important to make sure that um, check which row in the detector is on the same height than the X-ray source point where the X-rays come from because they emanate from one point as a cone. So then if you uh, use a, a row in the detector too high or too low, then uh, the data is not coming from the same horizontal slice in the object. There is only one row in principle, uh, ideally, in the detector that collects data from the same horizontal plane of the object when it's rotating. But that's something Alexander will help you with. But it's just good to keep in mind that that's important. Then, uh, in this situation, well, the detector line you'll be using it needs to be inside your target. And there will be only one line here that really works the best. The other lines contain that your radiation will be slanted and not really collecting data from the same line. So, even though your, your target may, may be substantial in the Z direction, you should remember that this is a 2D problem and only one horizontal slice here matters and the interesting stuff needs to be on that line. So for example, if it would be too low here, you wouldn't be seeing the stuff you put inside. So that's something to think about. So here in this picture, this is of course the so-called sinogram and what's going on here is uh, for each angle when we turn our object a little bit. I just showed it rotating, but that's not how it happens in real life. You have to choose what is the angular step you will use. You can, I think, if you want, uh, you could take even like uh, 360 uh, pictures with one degree step. And here, that's what I'm showing, each column in this matrix is actually one row in the detector where, is data, where data is collected through our object, through a, a 2D plane. So they are collected like this. Yeah, it's, it's not completely in the center, yes. And I, I think there is nothing right in the center of the lotus, so that's why we only see these sine curves of stuff that's rotating. So there we collect all of them, and then it's good to remember that uh, recording one image typically takes uh, one second. It, it depends a little bit on the settings you use and, and how, how penetrable your object is, but a typical exposure time for one image is one second. So then uh, if you have and, and of course then uh, after exposure the object will turn and there will be some data transfer or something. So you could think that it, it roughly takes two seconds per uh, angle to measure the data. So if you have 60 angles uh, you'll be done in two minutes 
And then uh, if you have 360, then it will be like 12 minutes, I guess, according to a quick calculation. That may be wrong. But anyway, you need to calculate. So if you really want many images, then just compute that it's two seconds per image, the runtime of the measurement. And then here I just made this uh, <laughs> fancy looking quick and dirty reconstruction using uh, the IFAN beam command in MATLAB. And what you will get from the measurement, you will get uh, the sinogram. Of course, you will get, uh, if you want, you can get all the uh, full images, but well, what you really use in the tomography is just the sinogram containing one row from each image. And you will get this kind of quick and dirty reconstruction IFAN beam so that you can see that something reasonable is going on in your data. And also you will get uh, either a matrix for the fan beam geometry uh, to use in the reconstruction, or you can, if you want to do a matrix-free method, uh, just using the radon and I radon, you can but then your object needs to be quite small, like a fingertip size, so that uh, the measurement is roughly parallel beam. If your image is bigger, like this lotus, uh, the geometry is so heavily fan beam that uh, radon and I radon will not work. And then one might ask at this point, why not then use uh, MATLAB's fan beam and I fan beam commands? And they are fine if you have dense angular sampling, like here you have pretty dense but if you are working with sparse tomography, like 20 angles or so, uh, it doesn't work because MATLAB's internal implementation of the, the uh, IFAN beam command actually passes through the parallel beam, Radon and I Radon. So it kind of uh, reconfigures the data, somehow interpolates into the parallel beam and, and back somehow. And this is completely okay if you have a lot of angles, like like thousands of angles, because then you're pre pretty much using either parallel or fan beam. If you have so many angles, you kind of have every possible line represented roughly in the data. So you can move between the two geometric representations of the data. But then if you collect sparse angle fan beam data, really doesn't contain all the lines corresponding to the parallel beam data with the same imaging angles. If you just think about it, you, you see that it's, it, it's just a completely different collection of lines. So uh, a few years ago, uh, unfortunately, uh, my instructions to students contained use IFAN beam, but there were mysterious big errors. And then we found out it's the modeling error from this fact. So anyway, um, you will get a matrix that models your measurement. Okay, uh, questions at this point, maybe? Yes. So you, it, yeah. I think it's it's actually quite a good idea to take, for example, 360 angles to kind of have the complete data or quite high resolution, small angle data, and it just you just throw away most of them and leave maybe like 20 or whatever you want to do, how how sparse you want to go, and then you just use. And also when you take many angles like 360 or or maybe even more, then. Um, you have a ground truth also, or maybe it shouldn't really be called ground truth, but anyway, it's a dense angle reconstruction that has much higher quality, even with minimal regularization. So it's good to have, I think. Yes? Uh, if I take uh, very many angles, but uh, then I decide I want to work with humor for whatever reason, can yes. I Yeah, you can. I mean, uh, the idea is it, when you have the matrix for the full uh, kind of dense angle measurement for, for lots of directions, 
Then uh, when you want to move to a sparser data set, you will just uh, leave out those measurements that you don't want in your data set. And also from the matrix, you can remove the corresponding lines from the matrix. And then you will end up with, with a sparse angle data set uh, and a sparse angle measurement matrix. Yeah. yeah. So if you measure the dense angle thing, then it's quite easy to go from there to a sparse <coughs> situation. Okay, so then uh, let's let's uh, recall 